Welcome to Hopkinton Coffee Break, your home for current community talk with Patricia Duart, Darlene Hayes, and Connie Wright. Hello, welcome to Hopkinton Coffee Break. Thanks for joining our little break today, and we are delighted to have a new friend we're meeting, Meredith O'Brien from Southboro. And um, so interesting, we're just getting to know Meredith a little bit, and we're going to talk a little bit about what she does. Um, I'm so just He's a prolific author with three published books, and uh, just so exciting to have you. Thanks for being here. I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. And she has a lot of connections in Hopkinton. You were saying your brother lives in town? My brother and his family live in town, cool. and people who go to my church live in town. Yeah. So yeah. And you're a neighbor, South Bro. Yeah, just not that far. Five minutes away. You know, and you have kids? I do. I have two 19-year-olds who are freshmen in college, twins, and a junior at Algonquin. How cool. And, the, and that's actually... If you dig back, how we got connected is because okay. you have twins, mm -hmm. you connected with someone who's a friend of ours, Teresa Boyce. Right. Well, I used oh. to go to a Mothers of Twins club okay. with her when her, wow. her girls were little and oh. my kids were little. So, yeah, yeah. A, lot of, a lot of tentacles in Hopkinton. And Hopkinton. because your newest book had to deal with music, and Teresa's a fan of the station I work for, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, like, I find out, oh, this local author is coming on, and I looked, I was like, Oh, I want her to She's come on here. my show. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. And so, you're on The Real Housewives. Are you part of The Real Housewives Facebook page? Not yet, well, I but I know my sister says I should. Oh, well, I you should. Be. <laughs> it, it's the theme of her second book, Mortified, a novel about oversharing. Okay. <laughs> yes, it's more of a cautionary tale, that I'm one. I'm teasing. <laughs> yeah. well, I want to hear some, let, let's talk a little bit about these books, okay. sort of how they started and what they're mm -hmm. about, whichever one you want to start with. Or maybe, well, the most recent one is Mr. Clark's Big Band, okay. and it started... Uh, of Vanna mm -hmm. White of it. <laughs> it's nonfiction. It is nonfiction. I, um, it's about the middle school music director in Southboro, okay. and my son at the time, I, my son was a drummer in the jazz band there, and in his seventh grade year, one of his good friends passed away unexpectedly. He was a 12-year-old who had a heart ailment that they wouldn't have known about had they not checked for it. And, and the community was really hit hard by it. The community drew together. And I, in the past, I've read a lot of nonfiction. I've read a lot of journalists spending a year following people around. And I thought, what if I followed around this really dynamic music teacher while he guides these children through their last year of middle school, and how does he do it? And, um, and so I spent the 2012-2013 school year shadowing their middle school band to see how they would cope. And, uh, and they did well. They did very well. So, wow. so you have, uh, in addition to writing, mm -hmm. you also... I teach journalism at Northeastern University. Yeah. How long have you been teaching there? I've been teaching there since the fall of 2015. Uh, okay. Previously, I, I did a part, uh, temporary gig at Framingham State. I taught okay. writing and journalism, and I have taught at UMass Amherst as okay. well. Wow. Well, that, now, you know, organizational person I am, I'm going to go back to, how did you get into journalism? Did you, did you major in, in college, or how did you get into the field and then start writing sure. independently? Well, I started uh, college as an English major and quickly switched over to journalism ah, and then okay. worked for uh, the student newspaper at UMass Amherst mm -hmm. and then worked in newspapers for years oh. and then went to grad school and then start, started teaching and came, we, my husband and I lived in Washington DC for okay. a while then we moved back up here mm -hmm. to Eastern Mass and I became a freelancer, especially okay. when my children were born. Sure, sure. yeah. So Mr. Clark's Big Band, that's a, that sounds like a, a very interesting read. And then this is this caught my eye, and then we'll talk about your, mm -hmm. or is this the most recent, or is that the most that's recent? The most recent book. is actually Mr. Clark's Big Band. Yeah. Ah, okay. That's my first book from the 2007. Sub, the Suburban Mom, now, you know, that catches all of our eyes. <laughs> so tell, Notes from the Asylum. Yes. I love it. Tell, me, tell us about this book. Well, I used to write a regular column for a local, uh, a local parenting publication as well as an online publication, and, then, and they were humor humor mm -hmm. columns about parenting and raising kids. And so I decided to compile them all together. And they trace the moments from pregnancy with the twins through the birth of my third child. And just it, they would be horrified if they actually read what's in here. <laughs> so we this. don't like to talk about it. <laughs> what up, Tooth Fairy? <laughs> yeah, it, it, was all, it was meant to be yes. self-effacing. Now we have like a whole 
like chapter on the elf on the shelf. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, oh, when I see, well, I'm so glad we didn't have oh elf on the shelf. I, yeah. Elf yeah. on the shelf. The tooth fairy in that column uh -huh. had a problem because she kept forgetting to give money, and then eventually had to just put a whole bunch of cash under the <laughs> pillow <laughs> for being so tardy. <laughs> oh my goodness, yes, I can relate so much. Oh, yes. can we? And all? I read the little synopsis on the book, and it definitely reminds me of Irma Bombeck's writing. Well, and she was an like, inspiration. I loved Irma Bombeck. I loved writing. Irma Bombeck. My mother was a huge fan, so I remember reading her books as a, you know, mm -hmm. literally, I think I was a young teenager yeah. reading them. Yeah. And so. And wow. then the middle one is fiction. The middle read one that, is read fiction. Read that title. What is it? I can't see it that far. Mortified, a novel about oversharing. Right. So out of what is no, I was about blogging. Social I was a, media days. I was a blogger, and that was before Twitter and all that. Okay. that was so I would notice that all of these not all of these, many parenting bloggers at the time, this is probably in the, in the 2000s, were sharing so much intimate personal detail. And I would read it and say, how do you still have friends? How do, your, how do people talk to you? How does your husband talk? You're right. so revealing. And so I thought, well, what if I wrote a book about a blogger who had no, no filter? She would put her name, she used a pseudonym, but she, in the book, the pseudonym falls away, but it's about the consequences of sharing that much personal information mm. on the internet, and so it's more of a cautionary tale. It's funny, but it's yeah. it's but but so it's very different. Mm -hmm. You know, two I guess blogging is nonfiction. Mm -hmm. You know, the Mr. Collects Big Band nonfiction, mm -hmm. and then fiction. Yeah, how do you which is the most fun, and what do you love to do, or how are they different? How's the process? Different? They were completely different because I I loved I wrote these columns for the Suburban Mom right. over a period of years, mm -hmm. and so each column was inspired by something that happened in my house or something that I saw, mm -hmm. and those were largely rooted in the insanity of what I was experiencing <laughs> and saying, "Does anyone else have this situation?" Well, oh <laughs> and so I would put them out. And then um, the middle book was more, I couldn't, I didn't feel as though I could write personally because I didn't want to reveal that much. Mm, right, right. But I thought, I'll try my hand at writing a novel. And then the last one just kind of fell into, it was just a situation where uh, Eric Green, the boy from Southboro, passed away. My son was very affected and I hadn't picked up a third, a new, a new project. I like right. to have a new project. And so I just kind of launched myself into wow. that. And I, but, you know, chronology of, of the events and happenings. Yes, yeah, so it's a year. Pieces. It's a chronology of a year. And yeah. how to mm -hmm. heal and how to go through mourning and things like that. And I, th I know we've talked a little bit about how that there are certain teachers people get connected with, and usually teachers that are in the arts mm. have a more mm. of an emotional bond with the children. Mm. And um, I know that um, this book must go into some of the kind of the story of how He's um, helped them along, and well, Mr. Clark, Jamie Clark, who lives in next door Upton, I'm pointing. I don't know if I'm going <laughs> in the right direction, but he uh, he's the kind of teacher who takes risks. Like if there's a line, he goes right up to it, and he <laughs> will. He's very funny. He says crazy things. Like there were many a times he loves. He loves projectile vomit jokes and oh, diarrhea oh, jokes. And I would, be, I would love that. Which I is would, perfect for teenage yes, boys. Yes, and I would afterwards be like, can you not? Like, I, I had a bag oh, yeah. in my purse. I'm like, you're going to make me sick. But um, <laughs> So he tells these crazy jokes, but he also becomes very emotional with his students. He lets them see him mm, sad. Mm -hmm. he, he asks them to put their emotions into a ballad. And so he says, well, if I'm not genuine with them, they're not going to be genuine in the, through their instruments. Mm -hmm. And through the year where they were afraid to play this one piece that was written in honor of their, their friend who passed away. They were terrified of making a mistake, right. thinking that if they made a mistake, they'd be dishonoring him. Mm -hmm. He tried to create this atmosphere of, it's okay, There's gonna be, there are no mistakes because anything you do is okay. And Aww. he put his emotions out there so that they would feel like they could. And he is a, he's a remarkable teacher that he has connections to students that he's, he taught years and years ago, and I was thinking, I don't keep in track with it. any of my middle school teachers. Right, like he's, right, but he, he, it's like a, a cult of, kind of yes, and, he, and people are, at the more that I've spoken with people after the fact, people who have participated in bands, they say that they have an intense connection with their band directors yes. because of that. And I think we, wow. we talked briefly about when the band director passed away from UMass Amherst, mm -hmm. that marching band, how emotionally impacting that band director was on not only the band that existed now, but 
previous to that and ongoing where mm -hmm. their band members still, and I mean, I was watching the Rose Bowl Parade this year, mm -hmm. and when, that, when the UMass Marching Bands go by, they still recognize Mr. Parker mm -hmm. as, you know, the, the beloved band teacher, things like right. that. I know there's, like, you know, a sister-in-law always will post up, like, when there's something going on on a game and mention him, that there is a bond on these, you know, they travel together, they do a lot of performances together, mm -hmm. so they're doing things beyond the classroom in a band and things like that. Right. So Absolutely. You, three different ways, you know, each book was written differently. Mm -hmm. So when you reflect on that process, um, can, can you compare and contrast, you know, I, I realize one may be cheesecake, one may be chocolate cake, and you like them both equally, but is there an ability to say which you may have enjoyed more, and was there one that really you struggled a little bit with and you had to you know, work through that struggle. I mean, I want to hear, because right. they're all very different. Well, The Suburban Mom was fun, only because it was like mom's revenge. Like, right. I right. Right. write about putting it down. You won't yeah. eat. And so I'm going to write about how you can't read yet, but I'm going to write about how you how can't you eat. Won't. So it was more cathartic, yeah. cathartic to write about, write a humorous piece about that. Mr. Clark's Big Band, I felt a lot of pressure because not only did all the students who were participating in the bands know about it, the whole school knew about the people in the town, I didn't want to let them down. I right. didn't want to let down Eric Green's parents. I didn't right. want his family to feel in any way negative about right. it. And so I would see the kids who, when I saw them, they were in eighth grade, and by the time the book was published, they were graduating high school, and they would be seeing me around town saying, when's the book coming out? When's the book? And so wow. I felt I owed it to them. So that was... It was a it was a beautiful experience to write it, but it was also I felt like I wanted to do do a good job for More them. Pressure. But it yeah. sounds like like you said, um, life just sort of like life you captured there, and then the situation with your son in middle school mm -hmm. just compelled you to think about how to how to do that. So my question, kind of follow on to Connie's, is so your next project, and as mm -hmm. a journalism teacher, do you how do you well, first of all, we'll think, talk about what might be your next project. What do you have in mind? And how do you go about, okay, what, what makes you think about the what the next project ought to be? And if it should be fiction or nonfiction? Or, it's, yeah. it's not. I have a mil, uh, notebooks of ideas, and oh, I just okay. write them down, or things in the news, or thing that, things that might inspire me to write maybe a short piece or a, a longer piece. And before I decide what I'm going to plunge into, it needs to really grab me. I need to yes. be able to see it through and imagine the writing process and how long it would take and whether or not it would be interesting to anybody else to read. Right, right. So it's, 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 there isn't a, an exact science right. to it, but it's more, I've got to be really interested. I'm going to be sharing this segment with my daughter, BC grad, who is a um, prolific writer. I mean, that's not what she does to her day job, but it's something she's tapping into now, just wanting to balance and keep her Good. creative juices flowing. That's great. And, um, you know, she, she's produced a cookbook because she's now into, you know, but that, that's something different. But to really, she's, she's doing a, you know, children's book and just trying to think about, you know, she's an artist, so she's liking to do the, the imagery. And, but was yeah, there also a difference yeah. between the nonfiction and the fiction? I mean, yes. how, how was that process? I mean, I researched the fiction in that I set it in, I think it was 2003 or four, the year that that blog was named the word of the year, when it was first becoming well more well-known People, yeah. may, like my grandfather would know about, like what it was, right. like people would know. So I said it then. So I did all of this research about just just different things about um, what was going on there to make sure it was set in the right time frame. I did some flashbacks to the main character's uh, childhood and used situations from my childhood stories for my, just, just to add in some real flavor into it. And so it was... It, it went back and forth in time, whereas neither of the other two books did. Mm -hmm. So it was more, I had to structure it in a different way and uh, make sure that everything I wrote was rooted in something real. How long does it take you to write a book, on average? Uh, <laughs> um, I can't really say for The Suburban Mom, because that was written that over. Yeah. That's a collection. That mortified probably a year. Mm -hmm. And then I started really writing the Mr. Clark book in earnest probably... Uh, 2014, the fall, and then I set myself a deadline for the first draft, and I told Mr. Clark, who I love but is a pain in the neck, and so I said, I'm going to get you a draft by January, July 1st, mm -hmm. and he's like, okay, and he texts me, oh, do you have it yet? Do you have it yet? And I'm, I'll get it, I'll get it, and so putting, a, putting that pressure on me sure. yeah. helped do it, but then I still took months to uh, go through it. And this was it. just published in 2017? Yes, yes. Wow. And so um, do the kids that... Um, 
were part of that band. Do they all have copies of this now? Well, we had a launch party at the Trotter Middle School in Southboro, and mm -hmm. I invited the, the every child, or not child, young adult, who was in the band, who I've changed all their names. They all had pseudonyms. They all wanted to pick their, their own names. They came oh, up with fine. crazy names. I'm like, no. <laughs> I, but, um, <laughs> I'm picking your name. But uh, they all came, and I gave I'm them. Spork. Right, 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 right. Someone wanted to be Queen Victoria. I'm like, oh, the yeah. jig is up. I'm like, there is no royalty. But, uh, so That's I hilarious. gave them all copies, and then the uh, the kids from who who wanted to who were in the band then played with the current middle school oh. band, and so it was kind of a reunion of sorts. And so those students got copies, and then families bought copies. Oh. Now, how do people get the book? You can locally go to Tatnock. Tatnock. Oh, right oh, in Westboro. Yes, right in Westboro. Yes, nice. right in Westboro. Okay. I love that book. And so um, yeah. I'm trying. To, there are a couple other local places that are on the website, MrClark'sBigBand.com, mm -hmm. but you can also get it through Amazon as well. I, I saw your because awesome. I, I know I saw the Suburban Mom on Amazon. Mm -hmm. and yes. Like that. So, um, I, so th and this is really a book of love and emotion. And oh, yeah. you've got some great reviews from this. I mean, from recording artists to other educators that have actually like read this and said wow I mean Ray Bean is fairly well known out there and um, yeah. I know Howard's very psyched um, for you to have be on his show next actually tomorrow Howard He'll, yeah so she's actually going to be on the swing show on WICN radio okay. tom um, mm -hmm. tomorrow interview with Howard Kaplan and um, Teresa um, and uh, Lisa are huge Howard Kaplan fans. Mm. And so that's how the whole connection. Teresa and Lisa, I don't know these people. Snappy so. Dogs. Oh, of course. They, <laughs> yeah. they love yeah. jazz they lo and they love swing. Mm -hmm. And they're actually very, they're fairly involved with our station. Ah, and okay. so um, they, co they connected the, um, Meredith to Howard. Howard connected Meredith to me. And, but the how deeply emotional and how it impacts children within our own community here. Mm. And I mean, these kids are actually still in high school. Right. So, you know, these are things. Um, last, and actually, I, I don't think it was last week. I think it's within this week. We got an email from the Hopkins High School. Um, I still have one kid in the school system. And um, they're charging the parents $35, which I think is a steal to do this. But because of, like, what happened with the Green family, uh, there's a boy in town that uh, called, um, what's Evan's last name? Girardi? Girardi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he passed away from a, he had a known heart, but the Green boy didn't. That they're actually coming into Hoppy and High School, the parents pay thirty-five dollars, and they're actually doing heart screenings on that's amazing the high school children, and um, it's an elective thing, mm. and so yeah, we're going to do it with my daughter, and the um, is to try to find things that are affaffecting children's hearts now, mm. as the, the, I guess has been a, a adolescent increase in like heart disease and heart issues, mm. so to like look for that. So I think one, I want to do kudos to Hoppy and High School for recognizing this and bringing this out, and um, you know, I think this also affects, like, you know, I would love to, I'm going to actually talk to them about this book. Well, there are, unfortunately, mm -hmm. some school at some point, uh, schools at some point are going to deal with the loss of a student, yes. and yeah. regardless of the circumstances, and they grapple with how do they deal with this? How yes. do they handle the children, and how do they actually validate the grief and the mm -hmm. loss? Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, the Southboro School District did a fantastic job helping these children through a difficult moment where at the mm. be after their friend died saying, I don't think I can, I should celebrate another birthday because Eric's not going to get one. Right. Why should yeah. I go, even apply to college? He's not going to get to go. And mm -hmm. so they went to where the kids were, and Mr. Clark especially, and I think it's a model for schools that do lose someone. Just how they can handle and it. I mean, Administrators I and teachers might benefit yeah. from a book like this just to you well, know, understand how to I know in my daughter's help. class alone, I mean, she's a senior now, but they, she's lost two classmates. Wow. And that's, that, that's a lot. I mean, I know in my graduating class from high school, we had lost Yeah, two. I was going to say, but, I, I, but I, I, every so year about they, yes. you know, I uh, I'm thinking that there's, 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 there's still, these are small towns to mm -hmm. be affected. Right. But, you know, so I mean, I graduated 108 kids, and one was killed in a car to lose one, I mean, well, like, accident. One yeah. was killed in a motorcycle accident. But back to the is. book, I, it mm -hmm. sounds like there's multiple messages. I mean, it is about um, you know how to handle loss, but it also sounds like um, it's a bit about inspiration. Oh, the power of music and a and a teacher who's willing to do what it takes to yeah. help you. So, wow. um, so there's 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 a lot um, to this. Um, as you think about, uh, you know, what next? 
<laughs> well, I'm working on a memoir, actually. Oh, oh. do tell. Your well, memoir. it's about a period of time, a specific period of time. Actually, it started when I was interviewing Mr. Clark for the big band, when I started experiencing uh, some weird symptoms that I wasn't quite sure of, and then two years later was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Oh, mm -hmm. oh dear. And I was concerned that the disease would not allow me to finish writing, would not allow, a lot of things happened during yeah. the same sure. time frame when this was all happening. My mother passed away and other things, oh. it was just, mm. and so the, it, the book is a, is a memoir, medical memoir, about how you go from, your, you take a, medical curveball, yes. and how do you change your life to a new normal, right. and how the first part is about the leading up to finally getting diagnosed, and the last part is how do you move forward, yes. how do you readjust your life, and, be, and the hardest part is how do you be okay with that, yes. and that's what that so is. Must have been, I, I'm sure one leading up to the diagnosis, you know, you know it's sort of like you're on a full spectrum of all the what ifs. Right, what is and, this, what's and, happening? And, and you know, right. there must scared have been, to death. There's there's that double-edged sort of relief. Now I, I have a name to give it right. now, but now I need to know, okay, how am I going to deal with it? Exactly. Um, you know, the good news, technology and, and therapies are improving every day, so. We're very, I'm very lucky, of, very fortunate. But it of, opens up a whole different set of concerns and thoughts. Mm -hmm. We have some of the best doctors in Boston. We do. Yeah. We now. do. So, well, that's interesting. So you're just starting that one. I have a... a a very rough, rough okay. draft of it that I'm sending out to some trusted readers, sure. and I know it needs a lot of overhaul. It's not yeah. even close to being pitchable yet, but yeah. still working on it. How much well, is here. technical and how much is emotional <laughs> in the memoir? I mean, technical as far as your um, disease and it's the not. It's not. It's a very user friendly. I Touch. hate technical. Like when things get mired in in acronyms, I go to sleep. <laughs> and so Me I too. <laughs> it's a, I mean, I might say there are a few parts where I might quote from a medical report, but just to say so people can see this is this is what they give you. Right. Then you have to say, well, what the heck does that mean? And so then yeah. you go and you look <laughs> it up and put it into user friendly. Yeah. It's it user friendly. Uh, language and it's also not a sad downer it's like it's I apply the humor of suburban mom into it like kind of yeah. after, at the end of all of this tumult I decided I need something positive so in the middle of the January 2015 horrible winter yeah. oh, God. I decide oh, forget. I want a puppy and I'm like, I don't know why I was thinking. It was a stupid, stupid thing. But I'm like, I want a puppy. In, in, in the feet of snow. <laughs> and, and so we brought home this tiny little yappy puppy. And, I'm, and then I'm outside at 2 a.m. going, what, what was I thinking? Is wrong? <laughs> right. And so the dog. just things like that. So it's not, it's more about everybody has something in their lives. Or they know someone who has some unexpected change in their health. And it's just, you still have to go on. You still have to move on. You have choices to make. Mm -hmm. And how are you going to, what are the choices you're going to make? Right. Uh, to you. Thanks. That's really yeah. cool. You want to talk a little bit more about this? Uh, I, um, yeah, I kind of lost my train of thought. Hold on. One, you can follow Meredith on Twitter, and it's um, at Meredith O'Brien. I think one of the things I was going to say is you're not self-published. So oh, that no, you that actually was have one been with question. Wyatt McKenzie mm -hmm. in Oregon, and it's you know, it's a fairly well-known publishing house. Mm -hmm. Have you all, are all three of your books? They are. Them? They and, are. Um, How did you choose them, or did they choose you? Oh uh, well, uh, Nancy Cleary, who is the publisher, she did a uh, a feature story with the, one of the publications I wrote for, and I happened to see her profiled, and and I called her and I said, well, you were just profiled in the same same uh, publication where I run my columns. You want it, you interested in a in a book of columns, and that's how it just started oh, from cool. there. So the book was well, it wasn't done yet, but this just in a collaboration right. sort of approach right. so with that you, publisher. So you have an this editor there, or, um, or has it changed because your genres? Well, changed. Well, I haven't had an editor like more. My editors have been writer friends got or it, other it, people it, who it. I would say, please run this through. And I actually just finished an MFA program through Bay Path University, mm -hmm. cool. and lots of the. Uh, Mr. Cl large sh chunks of Mr. Clark's big band were workshopped through classes with oh. fellow writers. Interesting. So. so now, do you play an instrument yourself? No. I am. Awful. I'm assuming in this is going to have some music terminology. Music oh yeah, I had to. Yeah. I had to write all these things down, or I text Mr. Clark. What the heck do you mean with that? And I mean, the most musical I am is I sing Adele really badly in the car, <laughs> and the kids say, "Please shut up." <laughs> and, and so I, I have not a musical bone in my body. So all of it was was an education for me, uh -huh. learning all the terminology, and I read books on jazz and mm -hmm. researched each song they played and. 
So that must be very cool for your students. I mean, obviously, to know that their their professor is a published author, and you're you know you're talking for well, it's journalism that you're teaching, but mm -hmm. you're talking. I mean, well, when experience. I talk about interviewing, like how yeah. you interview people and what you choose to leave in or what you choose to leave out, how do you approach people yeah. at difficult or different times in their lives? So I I'm able to explain that from the writer perspective. So when they read or see an interview that somebody's doing, they can understand what it feels like to be the person doing the interview. Yeah. So I can apply those stories to, to classroom. So what's the most discussion. challenging thing that you find your journalism students have to deal with to, be, to get good at what they do? Yep. Well, we're in a very interesting time period right now. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> in my, the class I teach is called Interpreting the Day's News. Ah. So the department wants us to use the day's news. And the day's news for the last several semesters has been kind of off the hook. Like I have They're unprecedented as far yes. as I've ever seen. I love news, but mm -hmm. this is just almost too much for me. But I have to treat that, have to educate them about what is the role of journalists. They're not to be promotional. They're not to, how to filter. They, how, they've got to filter. They've got, their job is to find the truth. Right. And how can you get truth and truth is subjective and how, and so trying to educate them about the purpose of journalism right now in a time where it's under fire uh, from many different yeah, um, right. corners. I will tell you though, some of what I've noticed going on here in the U.S., when I lived in Europe in the mid-80s, I saw similar journalism really? mm. that was promotional, sensationalistic, mm -hmm. promotional. Yes, there were, I lived in Germany, and so mm -hmm. yes, there were you know, the Allgemeine and the, the Spiegel, but there were these other purported mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, I'm seeing kind this of like happen a replay. here. Mm. Yeah, and I just didn't know. It's like, wow. We are getting close. Oh, my time. goodness. This is but so I, fascinating. And just a couple yes. community shouts again. Mm -hmm. um, Live for Evans events coming up in a couple of weeks. We're halfway through the whole groundhog thing. So, you know, winter's closing out. But let's start looking for some of these spring gals out there. Live for Evans, the HEF, and Bay Path. You know, Come Meredith, support, it's a privilege. I am. I may actually even be at the Do studio tomorrow the when you come in to um, great WICN, and I, you're going to love being on the air with Howard. But yeah. thank you so much. Well, thank you for being for here. Me. Thanks so much, and congratulations on your, on your continued well, success you. from Fun Reads out here. We're the Hiller Volleyball Team. My name is Emma. My name is May. My name is Shelby. My name is Sophie. We're Alma Gal and we love H Camp. We love H Camp. And I volunteer for H Camp TV. And I watch H Camp TV. And I love H Camp TV. And I love H Camp TV. We love H Camp TV.